Good evening, everybody. And it's lovely to be part of this very distinguished society. And I'm very happy to, to take up perhaps 35 minutes of your time to tell you a story. The history of my orchestra is very, very extraordinary, extraordinary. And these events that we're going through now, seen in the whole picture of the oldest professional regularly playing orchestra in the country, is truly remarkable. Um, my great and distinguished and famous predecessor, Sir John Barbaroli, did an amazing thing for the Halle. After the Second World War, in six weeks, he put an orchestra together and gave their first concerts. And his leadership and espousing the cause of the Halle in the period after the Second World War is not only very famous, but very remarkable and very brave and determined. The story about Charles Halley that I wanted to try and speak to you all tonight, um, more inspiring even than that, more inspiring than the experience that Barbaroli gave the country. Halley was an extraordinary man, and I've longed for ages to be able to tell his story, because it's so little known. I imagine that many of you are fond of music, Many of you are perhaps fond of concerts or opera as much as museums and exhibitions. Um, many of you perhaps don't know Manchester as well as you know Highgate. But I'm going to tell a story that I think needs to be known nationally. What he gave us, no one else had done before and nobody else really has done since. Carl Haller because that was his name originally, was born in a little town called Hagen, which is in that part of Germany that we call the Ruhr. It's northeast of Cologne, northeast of Dortmund. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were perhaps 4,000, 5,000 people. Halle, who's written a very, very entertaining autobiography and diaries, tells us that it, it was so small it had one policeman and one night watchman. But what it did have, and this is really important for an understanding of who he became, it had a very, very rich, active and enthusiastic musical life. His parents were both very musical. His father conducted the local orchestra and the local choir. And so he was brought up immediately into a sense of music being central, not peripheral to his life. Would that were true more in our country? His father was an immensely supportive man. And it was important for the young Carl because he was actually physically rather weak. When he was eight, he had a very bad attack of measles. And that meant, shall we say, socially distancing himself on a very serious level. And by the time it was cured, it turned out that he'd got a very serious inflammatory condition in his eyes. Can you imagine? He was then put to exist in a dark room for hours and hours and hours on end to try and solve this problem. It happened that there was a piano in this room. And he remembers as a child practicing the piano in the dark, learning how to negotiate the keyboard accurately. One of Halley's greatest achievements was to be a first-rate pianist. And he, he, he said, looking back on his life, that those hours after hours in that room, practicing in the dark and suddenly realizing that he could play something accurately because he judged the, judged the distance correctly, was a very great cornerstone of his belief in his own talent. He was a natural musician. When he was a very young boy, he discovered with his schoolmates that he had perfect pitch. He remembers particularly every year for two months. Can you imagine that a town as small as Hagen, I mean, what would that be now? I'm not very good on numbers, but perhaps Brighton, perhaps somewhere smaller than Brighton. A troop of actors and players would come and live in Hagen and perform plays and operas. And each year, his father conducted them. This happened, this particular story happened when he was 11. And by then, he'd been playing the violin for so many years. 
his principal instrument was always the piano and was always going to remain so. But he, he was taught the violin. One night, his father became so ill, he couldn't conduct that particular performance. So Halle, at the age of 11, volunteered to conduct the opera. And it was an extraordinary build of his own confidence that he was able to cope with it. What the performance was like, I can't imagine. The orchestra was made up of some professionals and some amateurs, and it was probably pretty ropey. But he had the confidence inside himself to give it a go. That's very significant in the story of his life. He conducted The Magic Flute. He conducted Der Freischutz. That's not an easy piece. He conducted many, many performances also that were in their repertoire of composers who now mean nothing to us. After that, when he was a little older, he went to Darmstadt. And that was where he heard a really good orchestra, a larger one, a one that played with, with real power and commitment and knowledge. But when he was 18, or in fact 17, I think, yeah, 17, in 1836, he went to Paris. And this decision was the first of three moments in his life that for me are crucial cornerstones in his life. Halley's character was well established by then. He was rather unusual looking. He had fair hair, which he, he had rather long. He did not cover his face in an enormous beard, which so many men did at that time. So he stood out from the crowd. And when he arrived in Paris, he needed pupils to earn money. And as he found more and more pupils, so he learned to, to know people and to how to work a room, if we could put it rather vulgarly. He was immensely charming, immensely brilliant. Those of you who are interested in the idea of pianism and the repertoire for the piano, will I'm sure be interested to know that he was the first person ever to play all the Beethoven piano sonatas in an extended series. This is something now that pianists do all the, the time all over the world. It's like a, a meal ticket to success, isn't it? Well, Charles Halley started it. And Beethoven was for him a crucial inspiration. He very often played the Emperor Concerto of Beethoven as a way to introduce himself to a new public. So he became easily accepted. So how did he get on in Paris? It was an extremely cultural place, wasn't it, at that time? 1830, 1840, 1850. It was really the most cultivated city in Europe. One night at dinner, can you believe it, he found himself sitting next to Chopin. Not bad, eh? And he was actually thrilled because, of course, Chopin was a living legend for him. And he was an immensely charming man, young, destined not to live long, and very weak. But he went, uh, Halle went to every possible concert that he gave. And he talks about him as a man and how generous and encouraging he was to him. And when we're 17 or 18, we all need that, don't we? We all need somebody to lift us up and give us a, a helping hand. And he talks in his book so beautifully about Chopin, how he nuanced the piano, how he played with such delicacy, how his final illness that gradually overwhelmed him meant that he didn't play his pieces as he originally wrote them. We know this from many witnesses, that he never played one of his pieces the same twice. And Halle recounts the amazing story of his beautiful Barcarolle, which some of you may remember, which is a very delicate piece, but builds to an incredible energetic climax before it dies away. And the last time he heard him play it, he was so ill, Chopin, that he never did the build-up. He played this, this incredible passage at the, towards the end of the piece as if he'd originally conceived it to be something far away and delicate, he played it so quietly with new nuances and expression that he'd never played before. So this, for, as you can imagine, for Halle coming from Hagen was an immense inspiration. The next person he met, can you believe it, was Franz Liszt, who was also an extraordinary personality. And the, of course, he was the opposite from Chopin. An enormous personality, played the, the keyboard with fantastic power. And I think that this made an immense impression in a different way on Halle. I think he tried to emulate him, not necessarily to his own advantage, but he learned to take something good from all these people. Who else did he know? Well, he, he knew a man very, very well called Stephen Heller. Now, he's a composer who I imagine many of you won't 
won't be familiar with. I, th I think the associated board exams often contain little pieces by Stephen Ella. But that's as far as it goes. He was a lovely friend, a German friend, so they could talk together in German. He met Wagner as a young man and said how charming he was and what a good companion he was. He also said that many years later when he met him again in a different part of their lives, how unbearable Wagner had become, how difficult and how intransigent and um, arrogant and um, opinionated. He remembers seeing on a winter's night Paganini sitting in the corner of a music shop dressed in a black cloak and he tried gradually to make friends with this strange gypsy individual. He became very easy friends with Mendelssohn. Can you believe this? He played chamber music with the wonderful painter, Angre, who was a fantastic violinist, and they played sonatas together. And of course, uh, Halle was fascinated by uh, pictorial art, and he loved painting more than he loved literature. But above all, the person who he got to know and who was important for him was Berlioz, Hector Berlioz, this extraordinary one-off creature, tall with this great fuzzy hair, and an immensely interesting personality, a man who didn't play any instruments apart from the guitar a little, but wrote some of the most original 19th century music there is. Now, Berlioz is one of my favorite composers, and when I realized that Halle had this connection to him, it warmed me to Halle even more. So, in 1841, he married Halle for the first time. He married a lovely lady called Desiree, who had been brought up in New Orleans. So she, she spoke French with her mother. They had a very, very happy marriage. And unfortunately, she died in 1866. But they had nine children. And he loved numerology. He loved games. He was married when he was 11 plus 11. And he made sure that they were married on the 11th day of the 11th month. It was very satisfactory. It gave him pleasure, that sort of thing. So his life was very full in Paris until the arrival, as I'm sure you will all guess, of the famous revolution in 1848. He was out with his friend Stephen Heller and they heard the first rifle shot. And the way Paris completely changed, the barricades went up, and particularly important for musicians, all the mothers took their daughters away from Paris like greased lightning, thereby depriving him of all his pupils. So along with other musicians, he had to find somewhere to go. And in the end, he decided to try London, dirty and noisy as it was. He became quite quickly famous. He played concertos. He even played Beethoven sonatas in public, something that was regarded with great cynicism and it was not at all considered to be a good idea. That is music not for the public, but for private. While he was there, and I think, if I remember this rightly, he was on the point of signing a contract to buy a house in Bath because somebody had told him down there in the West, you will have lots of pupils. There are so many mothers who want the best for their daughters. He was approached by a German from Manchester called Hermann Leo. Now, he was one of the directors of the famous gentlemen's concerts in Manchester. And this was the first connection that Halley ever had with Manchester. He did eventually go there to see what it was like. He didn't much care for it. And he thought, well, this isn't a place for me. But he became interested in the thing called the gentlemen's concerts that had been going for many, many years. Music, you see, ladies and gentlemen, in Manchester, started in about 1777 with a group of 26 amateurs who all played the flute. Flute was, as you can guess, rather fashionable in those days. But they played music together and they invited guests to come up to Manchester to play for them and to help them form an orchestra. By the time Halle got there, the orchestra was doing pretty well numerically, but it turns out not at all artistically. And this gentleman's concert had an enormous number of German musical enthusiasts because, as I said about his own town, it was natural and normal for music to be a big part of daily life in Germany, and it still is. So these gentlemen's concerts became the center of his activity in Manchester. And he was very interested to learn about the society in Manchester, as was Karl Marx, who was there at the same time, as was Friedrich Engels, who wrote so much research that Karl Marx used. 
This was a great time for Manchester's development. On the one hand, it had great success industrially, but on the other, the poor part of the country lived so abominably. So this musical appreciation society was filled with subscribers and they had concerts like we still do on Thursday nights. At this time, they built a new hall, the, re the Free Trade Hall, for the second time. It was rebuilt. And this got down to London. And a London paper, ladies and gentlemen, wrote, Mancunians are in advance of all other parts of the kingdom in their musical taste and knowledge. And this was one of the first times that Manchester's musical life became known down in London. Later on, of course, that remark was changed by the Mancunian sense of humour, and it became, what Manchester thinks today, the rest of the country thinks tomorrow. <laughs> so he was offered the contract to run this, this series of concerts, and he said, yes, I do it on certain conditions. I want to sack the orchestra. So he fired the entire orchestra and built it up again. This is very, very significant for his personality and what he, in the long term, gave the city. He built the orchestra afresh from the best talent in Manchester, from the best talent in England, and getting over some of his colleagues and friends from Europe, from Paris, from Germany. He set new standards. For the first time, he published the programmes of the concerts. Can you imagine a concert society that was so complacent that it never advertised, it never said to the rest of the community, there is music going on in Manchester. He sensed, you see, that he had, a, he had a name in life that he never thought he would have. He sensed he had a social purpose to bring music into Manchester. And this is something that now, as musicians, we all must still feel in whatever context we find ourselves. And it's also important to think, ladies and gentlemen, that there were no orchestras in England. It's difficult to understand that. There were no regular playing orchestras in London. If you wanted to do a series of concerts or a one-off concert, you formed an orchestra. You got a man to manage it and fix it, and the orchestra would come together. And almost all concerts at that time, well into the 20th century, were done on one rehearsal. Now, this is because England had a reputation, more than any other country in Europe, for being able to play music at sight. And we, people were, were jealous of this quality because, of course, it was cheaper if you only needed to pay the players for one rehearsal. But, of course, that meant that no orchestra had any core. You understand what I mean? They had no sense of purpose, of unity, of belonging together. This is something that Halle gave England for the first time. He even, in 1855, he conducted some operas in, in Manchester. I think it's such a pity that opera doesn't play a bigger part in Manchester's life. But the second thing of the three things that I wanted to tell you about, and I'm sure many of you will remember this, in 1857, there was the Great Art Treasures Exhibition in Manchester. More treasures of art than ever before were collected together, well over 2,000. They built a pavilion like a crystal palace in Old Trafford, near where the cricket ground is now. And of course, Mr. Halley, was asked to be in charge of the music. And it must have been about then that he put the acute accent on the end of his name, because we know he didn't have it in Paris. In fact, there's a letter extant that is signed by H-A-L-L-E-Y. Obviously, he was having problems in Paris, getting everybody to make sure that it was the correct pronunciation. In German, it would be Halle, yeah, with an er sound at the end. And the French would do Halle, unless you told them otherwise. So he put this acute accent, and I must say it's become one of the great logos of our orchestra, that this accent is always there and it sticks out. It is, ladies and gentlemen, the only orchestra in the world that is named after its founder. But why it was never the Manchester Philharmonic now becomes clear. He formed this orchestra, he extended the Gentlemen's Concerts Orchestra, but he got in more people from abroad. He got in some very distinguished people. And they gave concerts every afternoon at two o'clock, from May to October. And he himself, to keep up the tradition, only conducted on a Thursday. So he had other people to conduct. And he did an amazing thing, because at the end of this um, uh, exhibition, this famous exhibition, to which he contributed and became such a well-known Mancunian personality, he thought, we can't let this orchestra go now that the exhibition is over. 
why don't I try and keep this band of people together and keep working with them and we'll have a resident orchestra, just like we had in Hagen, just like they had in Darmstadt, for goodness sake. But England had never had. So he did that. And he felt that he wanted to try and help the public to realize what they'd be missing. Every form of the public, from the richest to the poorest. And he started the first Halley Orchestra concert. In those days, you know, the orchestra was just known as Mr. Halley's Band. And it stuck, that label stuck for years. But he wanted there to be a possibility for everybody in the community to come. He made sure that at the first concert, and there were 30 of them in the first season, there were some really cheap seats, even some standing room, which would be free. And people from all over Manchester came and listened in rapture. And he introduced the public to the most incredible amount of music. Of course, to begin with commercially, it was a slow start. 30 concerts, but at the end of the 30 concerts, he had two, and, two shillings and sixpence profit which is pretty amazing. There were cheap seats, and I must just tell you about one charming, charming fan who wrote to him after one of the concerts. Dear sir, this was in 1873, much later. Dear sir, having had the pleasure of attending your first concert this, e this season, I beg to tender you my best wishes for your future success. And not having had the pleasure of hearing such a display of talent before, I felt most delighted and beg you will please accept the small token I forward you, respectfully yours, an operative. <laughs> the small token consists of two yards of fine white flannel, which Halley kept for the rest of his life. <laughs> He was a great communicator, everybody. He was a wonderful man. He was so generous. He thought nothing of dipping into his purse to help somebody less fortunate than himself. He toured the orchestra all over the country. He adored, as we still do today, he adored going to Edinburgh. It was one of his favorite cities. In 1887, he was knighted. He had known Queen Victoria. He'd played for her and taught her children. In 1888, he married for the second time one of Europe's most distinguished violin players, Wilma Neruda. In 1895, after two tours to Australia and one to South Africa, he died very suddenly from what sounds like a heart attack, very quickly, very surprisingly. He was an amazing man. He had such energy. He needed, like Margaret Thatcher, very little sleep at night. His ability to cope with the demands of his life was extraordinary. You know, he never opened a letter until he had answered the one before it. He did this every morning. He faced languages with talent and determination. When he arrived in Paris as a 17-year-old, he learned French. And obviously he learned it very fluently, because you can see from the letters that exist still how good it was. When he came to England, he realized if he was going to do anything of value, he would have to learn English. This he taught himself every morning on the omnibus, as he said himself, going to the houses of his different pupils. He would leave the house with a, with a grammar or a dictionary and set himself exercises. And it took him four years, and then he started writing perfectly fluently in English. He managed all his musical plans and projects, building orchestras, changing things around, um, putting on operas, putting on concerts, himself. He never had a secretary. He did it all himself. He loved going on trains. How about this, ladies and gentlemen? How about this? He loved traveling on trains. On one occasion, this is his son, Charlie, writing, he was snowed up in a train in Scotland. And he and his two or three fellow travelers nearly starved when the guard remembered that a fine pig had been placed in the van. This unfortunate animal was promptly converted into pork chops over the engine fire and furnished an excellent supper in spite of his shrill protests at being immolated for the public good. It's good, isn't it? In the 37 years, he was in charge of the musical life of Manchester, of the Halle Orchestra. Th this gives you some idea of his industry, of his energy. He put on 32 oratorios, 
55 performances of Messiah. 110 symphonies, including some wonderfully important Berlioz premieres, not just premieres for Manchester, but premieres for England. The Halle gave the first English performance of the Symphonie Fantastique, for instance, also the Childhood of Christ. He did three performances of the Romeo and Juliet Symphony, one of Berlioz's trickiest works. He was a devotee, 214 different overtures, 183 different concertos, even the first performance in Manchester, of Mozart's clarinet concerto. He said, although it was by Mozart, it was a very lengthy grandfatherly affair. And rather than allow the audience to get bored, I omitted the last movement. <laughs> this of a work that is the darling of so many music lovers all over the world. <laughs> so you can see, can't you, that from his character, his assiduous behavior, his generosity as a man, that he gave England something that it needed. It, he gave a spy to the musical life of this great city. Let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, still the second city of the country. <laughs> and he showed an example to the rest of the world. And in fact, people often say that the London Symphony Orchestra, which was formed many years later after his death, was founded because London was so offended and jealous that the critics went up to Manchester and said, oh, these Mancunians have got something to teach those Johnnies back in London. And so London's musical life gradually changed. But Halley's musicianship and his determination, and above all, perhaps, his sense of social importance and how music can give us all something that nothing else can, was the thing that really we must remember him for. And in these very difficult times, as we, we're all fearful about what might happen to the, the future of orchestral life, and our, our audience in Manchester is already hoping and praying and giving us little bits of money and saying, we can't wait for you all to get back together. We realized that what he started was something that somebody would have done some other time, I suppose. But thank God, it was a man of such talent, charm and brilliance as Halle. And I'd like just to bring this little talk to an end by saying my one musical antecedent worked and lived in Manchester. And he was a man called Norman Cocker. And I wonder whether any of you have ever heard of him. He wrote a very famous piece for the organ. He was a very, very fine organist, which is still played at weddings. And it's a tuba tube. It's a terrible piece, but people still like it. Now, Norman was a great eccentric. And he wasn't totally part of our family life, large as it was. But Norman did something every week of extraordinary eccentricity. He arrived in a horse-drawn open carriage outside the town hall in Manchester at lunchtime on a Wednesday. And every week during the season, played an organ recital in the amazing organ that is still in the organ room in this wonderful town hall. When Barbara Olly came to Manchester, he heard that there was a contestant for popular appeal. And he started wearing a top hat and a cape as well, in direct contravention of uh, my, my great uncle's um, situation and popularity in Manchester. But that reminds me, in conclusion, I feel that it would be, well, interesting and rather unexpected to tell you all the little story about how. John Barbaroli came to England. And I wonder whether any of you have heard this story. He and his wife, the great oboist, Evelyn Rothwell, were in New York because he was the music director of the New York Philharmonic. Not a particularly happy relationship, and he felt that the opportunity to come to Manchester and build the Halle was something that would mean a lot to him. They got a berth on a cargo ship. This was at the end of the war. I mean, before the real end of the war, I mean, just when the war was still a very tense affair. And it was, there was a small number of other passengers. And as they became more and more delayed by the rumours of submarines or whatever that was going on, their journey got longer and longer. There were two other passengers, the famous actor, Leslie Howard, and his agent, who were coming over to London to see the rushes of Leslie Howard's most recent film. And as they got more and more delayed, one day the agent approached Barbara Ollie and said that they'd met, you know, and they'd become friends. And he said, look, John, 
I don't know whether or not this is a possibility, but we are so late and the whole of this film industry is waiting for us in London to look at these rushes and push this film forward. How are you getting to London? And he said, well, we have tickets on a flight that we've booked from Lisbon. And I understand this boat is going to dock in Lisbon for two days after we land or something like that. He said, do you think that we could do a swap? We've got a reservation, but much later, that's all we could get. Do you think, would you mind staying in Lisbon and we have your tickets so that I could get Leslie, this great star, to London? They agreed. They got to Lisbon. Leslie Howard gratefully took the tickets, boarded the plane, and was never seen again. That was how Leslie Howard died. That plane was shot down. He was never heard of again. And Barbara Ollie arrived and took the Halley Orchestra to new heights. Just think if he'd said no. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may be able to tell, this orchestra is a huge part of my life and indeed my family's life. And to have done 20 years there makes it a huge part of my musical education. It is incredible, and I hope I have a, the chance to conduct there for a few more years. Perhaps some of you will come and listen and come and say hello. But if that gives you some appreciation of who this man was and what talent he had that he gave to Manchester and then to the rest of the country, then you will perhaps understand why it is not called the Manchester Philharmonic, but Mr. Halley's Band. Thank you. <laughs>